Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Baker Kevran. I'm Vice President of the Atlantic, and I wanted to welcome you to this session in our design and sustainability track called How Do We Feed the World? A very important topic. We have a terrific panel here today Jason Clay from the World Wildlife Fund, Howard Yana Shapiro, who's with Mars Incorporated, and UC Davis, which he says is the world's greatest agriculture school, and Hugh Grant, the CEO of Monsanto. To moderate the panel this morning, we have Michael Spector, who's a staff writer at The New Yorker, where he writes about science, technology, and global public health. Michael had earlier career stops at The Washington Post and at The New York Times. His latest book is Denialism, How Irrational Thinking Hinders Scientific Progress, Harms the Planet, and Threatens Our Lives. Michael has twice received the Global Health Council's Excellence in Media Award, and he also received the Science Journalism Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So you are in good hands with him and with this morning's panel. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the kind introduction. I think it's true that Davis is the best ag school. So it wasn't just him who said it. Um, we're here to talk about what I think is the most important issue facing our planet, except perhaps the continued existence of our planet. And that's how we're gonna feed the people on it. And you know, whatever math you wanna do 50, 60 years from now, we're gonna to have to come up with 50 to 70% more food than we do now. We're gonna to have to do it on about the same amount of land unless we wanna get rid of the rest of the rainforest that we've already destroyed so many of. We're living in a world where we have crippling problems dealing with water resources, a world where two countries, India and China, are growing rapidly and producing middle class, more prosperous people that instantly start acting like us in at least one particular way. They eat a lot of meat. And when they eat meat, they eat grain, they use land, they use water, they suck a lot of resources up, and it's very difficult to tell people now that we've destroyed the world, you shouldn't do that. So when all this adds up, what we have is a real challenge ahead on how to feed the world in a sustainable way, and never forgetting that right now, today, a billion people go to bed hungry every night in a world that's relatively prosperous. So that's what I consider the framework here. And how we move ahead, how we do that in a sustainable, intelligent way, is the question that I think we need to address. And the, the first question I want to ask the panel, and anyone who wishes to deal with this can, is, what does sustainable mean? Because it's one of those words, words like natural that I absolutely have no idea what it means when people talk about it. Anyone want to? I, I guess the only definition that has any consistency around the world is the Brooklyn Statement, written by Lloyd Timberlake. It basically says we should leave the future with enough resources to maintain the lifestyle that they desire and not diminish their quality of life. If we take that at face value, uh, it's, it's easy for everyone to agree. I mean, who doesn't want to leave assets in place for the next generation or the 10 generations forward? It certainly was our parents' dream uh, to do that for us. And I think now the issue is, is that really possible as we look at the consumptive nature of the world, whether it's positive or negative, let's hold that off for another time or discussion, but we're running out of resources and we've run out of land, and we're running out of water use efficiency. And so how are you going to feed the, the people of the world? And, and that really becomes the sort of fundamental question. Without food security, you know, climate change is kind of irrelevant, because if we haven't really worked on it, there'll be no, no effort towards doing that. And so from my perspective, I sort of feel a pressure at this point for the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and I work on long-term projects. I, I work on trees as well as other uh, annual crops, which are generational. But if we don't have a consensus in general about what has to happen to build food security for the bottom billion, but it's really the bottom two billion, because that next billion is not doing so good either, then all of our efforts will be lost, because we will have failed to bring all the pieces together to make really quantum change. And, and that's the conversation. That is the conversation. What I see as a parallel conversation going on in the world are people squabbling about these issues endlessly. People, nobody's sitting around saying, gee, we don't want to feed the poor. No one's sitting around saying, we don't want to have a sustainable world. 
but they're screaming at each other about how to do that, how to grow food, what methods to use, whether one is better than the other, whether one is evil and one is blessed. And it seems to me like a lot of screaming and hot air is going on, and it's profoundly inhibiting the ability of people to do what they do best, which is move agriculture forward in a more efficient way to grow more crops and less land more healthily. Is that something you guys see as a problem, you? You obviously have to deal with this every day. I, I don't, the screaming in hot air, I, I don't, um, I, I don't know. I think I, I'm, I'm kind of a Howard, I'm, I'm intrigued. I think f for Aspen and for these conversations, the definition of a good day would be if we left with some um, description of, of actions because there's, there's a real temptation to scope the problem every year um, but never move past the scope. So if, if you say um, roughly we're going to have to grow somewhere in the region of the same amount of food in the next 50 years that we grew in the last 8 to 10,000 years, um, then that brings the immediacy of, so how are we going to get that done? And to your point on sustainability, um, my sustainability is kind of interesting because it's like a jealous possession because everybody believes that their um, definition or, or their version of it is, is the true path. And kind of like religion and politics, everybody believes that theirs is the truest path. And my kind of working definition on sustainability around this issue, if you look at how you're going to grow that amount of food in the next 50 years, which is for the 14 people in the audience, this is, um, th this is really a, a challenge for our grandkids. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's to Jason's point, how, how do you produce a whole lot more on the same footprint and consume less stuff? And in agriculture, the biggest stuff that's consumed is water and fertilizer. So if you could, if you could maintain, well, if you could maintain <laughs> soil yeah. and minimize those inputs, that, that kind of borders on a working definition of sustainability. But we have four or five decades to get this thing figured out. So let's, let's take that answer to your question and then take it one step further, which is, or maybe make the connection, which is, We've got to figure out what to measure. And I think the discussion about what the best practices are is getting us totally sidetracked. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the results we need to see? So the results around water. How much water is acceptable to be used to produce a calorie? How much water is acceptable to be, what, what kinds of BOD or, or oxygen demand in water effluents are acceptable? What kinds of other effluents are acceptable, what levels. Let's not talk about the practice. Let's let every farmer find the right practice for them. It may be organic, it may be IPM, it may be conventional, it may be no-till, it may be GM, it may be some combination of all of those. But find the practice that works. So we'd be technology neutral and focus on the results. Because if we don't get the results right, we don't get to 2050 with a planet or without starvation. That, that and is, so okay. everything we need to look at, habitat, how much new habitat is required to bring in to agriculture to farm cereals that produce few calories per hectare versus other crops that produce 10 or 100 times more calories per hectare. So we need to get the crops right. We need to get the metrics right. You're totally right. I don't think there's any disagreement. Here's where there's some disagreement. The idea that the sort of approaches, the practices that we should put those aside in our mind a bit, that's an intellectually attractive idea. Out there in the world, it doesn't seem to be working because people get very, very animated by how we're growing the food we put in our mouth, in our children's mouths. And they get animated in a, I believe it's fair to say, profoundly irrational way. So you get a lot of opposition to certain practices, like putting BT in a crop. It's fine if you're an organic farmer to spray it, on a crop. And people will swear by organic food and oppose you know, anything that's the same, but when the molecules have been moved around in a slightly different way. Not understanding that for 11,000 years, that's all we've ever been doing. OK, but, but I think, again, let's talk about, about the results. And let's take the air out of some of these discussions. Okay. So is lamb that's raised in the UK better from a greenhouse gas perspective than land that's raised in New Zealand and frozen and shipped to the UK. 
We know that it isn't. We know that it's not because we have the metrics to actually measure it. We need to do the same thing around no-till. I mean, is no-till actually carbon sequestering or not? Do organic potato producers use more toxic chemicals than conventional ones? It depends. But do you think no There's no the simple answer to this. Because well, I, I think you've got to start with science. If you, if you throw science out as the basis for the discussion, then we're all lost. I couldn't agree so more. So we've got to start with science, and we've got to get people onto the same page. What I found when writing about carbon footprints is if you write something saying, gee, if you live in the east coast of the United States and you care about your carbon footprint, you're better off drinking French wine than California wine because French wine comes, comes by in by boat and it's just much more environmentally benign. I think I'm prohibited from entering California after writing that. I mean, there's a lot of emotion attached to these things, even though like the science I think your is skin's there. a little tougher than that, actually. I became a, a retroactive Francophile. We wrote like that because we'd rather drink the wine in California ourselves. But I, 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 think, I think that... I think at Columbus, Ohio, it's okay to drink California right. wine. I think the wine. issue that, we, that enters that debate that you talked about is the notion of yield potential. Dry land rice is 1,650 uh, pounds per acre, more or less. Paddy rice in California in a mixed system of flood, drain, flood, drain is 13,000. Flooded rice using IR68 or the early Gerd of Kush lines is less than that. Now, do you know what the yield potential for rice is? I think it's probably 16,000, 18,000 pounds per acre done perfectly well. Now, what I have to fix is dry land rice. Well, but that's where I think, I, I, I think so farmers, for sure, but others as well, focus on yield. They focus on one metric and maximize it. And I think to solve the problem by 2050, we've got to optimize several things. We can't just focus on yield. We've got to focus on how much water it takes to make that, that rice as well. How, how, many, how, much, how many cubic meters of water per, per ton of rice with dryland? And, and you can't let rain-fed agriculture get off scot-free because if you're putting a field of sugarcane in, it takes more water than most natural habitat does. So there's less runoff, so there's less for biodiversity, which is where we get interested in this issue. Right, but this is where you get into the whole point of the, all of the metrics or the values you want to measure. You know, I'm interested in water use efficiency. We believe we can reduce paddy rice use by 70% water. 70%. Right. Huge breakthrough. It means that a lot of dry land rice could be as, as productive as paddy rice. It's a big deal. So nutrient and water, you mentioned nutrients. Yep. A third of the nutrients that are put on to corn are actually uptaken. A third blow away to Iowa from Kansas. And a third go into the water. So if, if we can make a plant that will take up the nutrients better, we can make a plant that will take up the water better. And finally, but most important, are we really delivering nutritious calories or are we delivering hollow calories? If you go to Africa, come with me anytime, I'll show you hollow calories. How do we get there? Because with water, it's an interesting thing in the United States. When laws started being passed about water use, a strange thing happened. Economies of scale developed. Agriculture became more efficient. We grow better products with less water. We make more products in factories using less water than we did before there was something like the Clean Water Act because it was required, because it cost money. With things like carbon use and water use, we know they're not free because we know there are tremendous penalties to using them, but they're, they're thought of as free well, because actually, we don't take money out of our pocket. So, so I've done calculations on some, some basic things like a cotton T-shirt or a... Um, a slice of cheese or a, um, a liter of soda or a, a, a hamburger. And if you take how much raw material it took to make that product, how much water it took to grow that raw material, and then what the farmer got paid for the raw material when they sold it, if you divide the total payment that they got into the amount of water that was used, you don't have enough money to pay a decent price for water. Absolutely. And that's all they were paid. That's for all of their inputs and the cost of land amortized and everything else. So these externalities that are currently not priced in food, especially food, are, are the ones that we really have to start worrying about. Because on a finite planet, it's real. Lack of water is real. Lack of arable land is real. We've got 2050 coming where I would say we're going to have to double production. It's not 70%. I think it's going to be doubling. Uh, how are we going to do that? 
Well, let's talk That's about how what we're we need to that. talk about. Yeah. Let's talk about how we're going to do that. How? You? It's what you do for a living. Yeah. I think uh, how we're going to do that is, uh, is clear. Uh, the speed we're going to do that is, is less clear. If, if you kind of closed your eyes and you said, um, the last invention that was made is the last invention. So there's no new stuff. So we, we have in our hands everything that we have to work, for, work with in the next 50 years. Um, simply by um, equaling the playing field, I think you unlock a lot of bushels. So, you know, we, we're in ski country. So if you think of the ski slope, um, last year's yield in the U.S. for corn uh, was 150 bushels an acre. Um, and if you draw the bell curve, that's the average. There was a whole bunch of people would laugh at 150 bushels. And in the West, out here, they would be proud to have 100. So the average for America is 150 bushels. Brazil, India, and Mexico last year were about 50-ish bushels. Brazil a little bit more, Mexico a little bit less. 150, 50, 50, 50 for Brazil, India, and Mexico. And in the same year, in countries that have got reasonable stats, Africa did about 25 to 30 bushels. If you said to the, the earlier conversation, better use of soil, better water management, better selection of seed, so forget biotech, just good quality genetics. If Africa moved from 25 to 50, so if their aspiring goal was one day I will be an in India or I will be a Brazil or I will be a Mexico, the move from 25 to 50 generates 2.1 billion brand new bushels of corn. And coincidentally, last year America exported 2.1 billion bushels of corn. So there's a, one quantum of export capacity this never happened. And I, I think if you said, hey, in 50 years, how do you make 25 go to 50? Brazil will get to 150 in a heartbeat. They're embarrassed. If Africa went from 25 to 50, the game right. changes. And that's with nothing new. That's husbandry. That's soil, water management, planting depth, mulching. It's, it's basic stuff. And this is not just about the productivity. So the impacts get reduced. What most people don't understand right. is that the, that's right. the poorest farmers, the ones that grow the least, have the biggest environmental impacts in absolute terms, but more importantly, in relative terms. Remember, I was saying we need to get the metric right. So what amount of soil erosion does a 25 bushel per acre farmer get per bushel versus 150 bushel yeah. per acre? It's, it's a lot more soil erosion. What's acceptable? Let's draw the line. Let's figure out how to get the metrics up to the right level. If you start talking about nitrogen, about water, all those things as well. We need, to, we need regenerative kinds of agriculture that aren't actually what the poorest people are doing around the world, contrary to a lot of public opinion. Everybody, the poorest farmers, half the farmers on the planet today can't feed themselves. That's, that's okay, so let's, let's get it right out on the table. If we're starting with that, if that continues by 2050, three quarters of the farmers on the planet won't be able to feed themselves. But it's a contradiction when you say. But we're a using farmer. farming as a social welfare system right now. No, that's true. We've got to use farming to produce food, and well, we need to deal with social issues in another way. Well, farming is a foot in the right direction. But you're talking about these places not in America, not in Europe, not even in Brazil. But well, it's n no, wait. It's not entirely that. I grew up on a farm in the U.S. Our income on that farm was less than a dollar a day per person. So there's poverty in the U.S. as well. True. I mean, it, we can't just say it doesn't exist here. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that my biggest concern for the future, and I'm pretty sure it's yours too, are those people who are struggling just to feed themselves. In great and that's where population today. is going to increase the most. And that is where the population is increasing, right. and it's where health care is the worst. It's where the global environment problems okay. are Okay, and worst. that's probably why... If you look at the genetics, I mean, genetics has, genetics got us here. We've got to dance with the one that brought us, right? So well, let's figure out genetics. But it's not the only solution. Two of the top 10 calorie producing crops on the planet, we really focus on a lot. Corn and soybeans. What about the other eight? A lot less focus. What about the eight most important crops in Africa or, sub or the subcontinent of Asia? Cocoa yams, sorghum, things that, that Why don't aren't. Why do we focus on them? It's really simple because the poorest of the poor use them 
and we're not taking the same attitude because they aren't Western crops. And, and, and really fundamental reasons, that's the it. the same reason we don't Actually, have great treatments for visceral no, leishmaniasis? No, but, but I think, it's, I, think it's a little, I think it's a little different than that. I think, for example, private sector companies haven't found a way to make money focusing on those crops, and governments have abandoned them. Governments are investing less in agriculture now than they ever have. And, and they're they not investing the kind of money it takes to do genetic engineering. But why would a private company, and I know that a representative of one is here, invest in those crops in those places? Why would a pharmaceutical company invest in vaccines in those places? You don't make money and you, and you basically get denounced for anything you do. So, so let's answer your question. In the next 12 months, why don't we put together the collaborative coalition that will take those 15 underutilized crops? You know, you can do a genome depending upon how you want to look at it, whether you want to use pack bioscience, Illumina, 454, or Sanger sequencing. And I'm just about finished with the uh, Theobroma cacao genome, which will be published, put in the public domain, and I've started peanuts. You can do them for about two and a half million bucks, three million bucks, it's 45 million bucks. It's the toolbox. Now, it doesn't give you anything. It's just a bunch of AGCTs. You gotta, at the same time, take some people along in the game. So once you've got these basic tools of information, you can make decisions. The real problem, I think, and while I appreciate what every seed company is doing, is there are no seed companies that don't have to worry about the bottom line to a group of investors 12 months a year. So c can anyone really think 15 years out? Can anyone think about vernalization? Can anyone think about nitrogen fixation? I have a whole list here. Switchable day length, emergence to harvest, frost tolerance, salinity. Drought tolerance. Ozone tolerance, optimific hybridization, non-hybrid uh, crops, submergence tolerance, annuals to perennials, C3 to C4, perennial polycultures. That's the game changer. Now, I can't ask my colleague from Monsanto, can you do these things? Because they'll say to us, we'd like to think about it, but we have a bottom line every month. So the public sector has to take every one of these things on in the other crops which aren't getting the game-changing activities that everyone's talked about. Looking at everything that Jason has talked about, that should be a series of matrices against all of these actions. And if we can't decide in the next 12 to 18 months, I'm going to actually start to lose faith that we're going to ever solve it. That's not happening. Well, I just well, said give us 12 to 18 months. I bet it could happen. But the, the You're awfully I, optimistic. No, I don't think it's optimistic. If you reverse, you know, w w you got the punchline, you designed the joke. So <laughs> we, we, we know what needs to get done. And we know that the time base is 50-ish years. To Howard's point, that these are two to three million dollar investments, and five years ago they were? 75 to 100. And before that, they were inconceivable. It's not and my, possible, actually. And my guess is, in the next five years, the two and a half, there'll be a quantum reduction. These will be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm, I, I talked about this last night. I am optimistic. And the danger in Aspen is, it's the gloom and doom scenario. We're never going to make it. The water's up to here. You know, I, I, I'm with Howard. This, this is doable. So I'll tell you a quick story. Um, because I think this is less. The technology is imminently. Five years ago, this was a dream. Today, it's two and a half million bucks. And in five years' time, it's hundreds of thousands. So the cost isn't prohibitive. The science is there. So a big piece of what Howard talks about is... If we all left here and said, you know what, let's go and have an Italian meal. What's the best Italian meal in Aspen that we can walk to from here? You do MapQuest, you do Google Earth. The guys wouldn't, they would just walk. But we would, we would find that restaurant and we now have MapQuest for these crops. So we have the street maps and the signs that, that code for desirable characteristics. So just good old fashioned, birds and the bees, just regular breathing, but accelerated because you have the street maps. So, we've been working for nearly 10 years on drought tolerance, which is one of the things on, on Howard's Christmas list, you know, one of his hopes. Um, an interesting model, and the jury's out, but an interesting model from a big company, because this is juxtaposed, juxtaposed. Yes, thank you. At the moment, big versus small, non-profit versus profit, American versus European, mainstream agriculture versus organic. 
And that is so yesterday. I think it's so historical. We've cracked the code on drought tolerance. We will launch drought tolerant corn in the US in 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. We've shared all that technology with um, NGOs in Africa. The Gates Foundation has funded it to the tune of $47 million. And I think that's the beginning of a model where companies, governments, and NGOs can share the responsibility for the development of these things. And where for pretty low numbers, you can start to literally crack the code in some of these bigger challenges. Companies aren't gonna do it on their own. NGOs are in a very lonely place. And governments have failed spectacularly in these agricultural projects. So I'm, I'm interested, a lot less in the technology, I think the hardest piece to crack is the relationships. But, but I think, you know, so we've spent the last Sorry, five or 10 minutes right. talking about genetics. And I think genetics is, is what has got us here over the last 8,000. It's gonna get us part of the way. But even with the best genetics, we're gonna get maybe a 50% gain in right. the next 40 years for a lot of the crops that we're talking about right. that are important. We're not gonna get there. You're right. We right. need to think about the food issue the same way we think about energy. We need wedges. We need to build wedges of different activities that are gonna yeah. add together. There's no silver bullet here. No. So we, you talked about productivity. Every crop that I, I'm aware of, and I've done research on dozens, there's probably 100 times, the best producer globally is 100 times better than the worst producer. The best country on average is 10 times better than the worst country. We have tremendous room for improvement through better practices. Yeah. One, two, technology. We know how to get more out of less water. We need to learn how to get more out of less land, but we're also discovering things. We know that if you water plants on one side, you will trick them into thinking they're gonna die so they put more seed out. We need to learn things like that to increase productivity. Uh, this is part of what this is all gonna be about. Waste, one third of all calories produced on the planet never make it to the consumer. That's criminal. That is absolutely criminal. And yet, 95% of our dollars are spent on research on productivity. Why aren't we spending more on reducing waste? Why don't we have a little handheld device that can tell you whether the food in your refrigerator is safe to eat or not? The leftovers. Why, it wouldn't cost 70 bucks. How much would it save? Money-wise, calorie-wise, planet-wise. Property rights. The Europeans are really keen to tie their foreign assistance to African countries to not use GM technology. That's their right. But what if they actually tied to their, their foreign assistance property rights? Because most African farmers don't own the land they farm. If you don't own the land, what are you going to invest in? Are you going to plant trees? Are you going to create a terrace by hand? Are you going to buy a new bit of technology that allows you to be more efficient in your fertilizer use? You're not. There is absolutely no way. Likewise, on the other end, if you're a technology company, are you gonna invest in new technology if somebody's gonna take it and use it and, and then all the money you invested is simply gonna go up in smoke? Degraded land, another whole strategy. If we don't wanna use new lands, forests, grasslands, wetlands, peatlands, et cetera, we gotta recover degraded land. There's right. between 250 million and 1.4 billion hectares of land that we can bring back that will be worth more than the neighboring lands. We You're can do it. We have the technology to do it. Wait, there's only two more things. Right. <laughs> and, and the reason I say this list is because these wedges are known. We've got a lot of people interested. This is the subject of a, of a symposium in Davos uh, this coming year. We are going to kick this off. We can have some results on all of these issues when we come back next year, hopefully, and talk about this again. Overconsumption. A billion people consume too much. A billion people don't have enough. And half of that billion people who don't have enough, ironically, are farmers. You know. Let's, let's start thinking about that. How, how do we look at protein? Right now, you know, the, the, from a planetary point of view, the cheapest source of protein is white fish produced from aquaculture, fresh water. And by 2050, it will equal poultry in total production. And after that, it will be ahead of it because it takes half as many calories to make white, a kilo of white fish because fish don't have to walk. They don't use energy that way, so they don't need as many calories. It's simple, it's not rocket science. Carbon, bringing carbon into agriculture is the one way to make every agricultural system more sustainable. 
If you want to have a single indicator of sustainable ag, I would say it's soil carbon. So anything that increases soil carbon. And there are lots of ways we know how to do it. We just need to get moving. And then urban agriculture. People in cities aren't going to grow their calories, but they can sure as hell grow their nutrition. You know, you can take um, waste water, waste heat from any kind of electricity generation facility and use it for urban green leaves and vegetables. All kinds of Detroit's looking exactly at this kind of thing. This could, by 2050, there are going to be as many people living in cities there is alive today. So unless we think they're all going to be fed from farmland in the countryside, we've got to figure out how to at least begin to do some fresh fruits, fruits and vegetables in cities. Everything you say is eminently reasonable, rational, and true. And something Hugh said I'd like to go back to, which is the science is there. Absolutely true. For an enormous amount of this, and genetically engineered products are going to help. They're not going to solve everything. No one ever, I believe, thought they would. But let me just, who here only eats organic food? Who doesn't eat genetically engineered food or thinks it's dangerous or harmful in some way? Really? Wow. This is the first audience I've ever been in where not one person raised their hand. That's great. Maybe we are moving forward. But my point is, the science and the technology can be there. Two million people die every year in India of TB. It's a completely curable disease. They have fantastic new technology so you can spit in a tube and know whether you have TB in two hours. But they don't use those technologies. They use outmoded things that are useless and misdiagnose millions of people. So, you know, my question is, it isn't just the science being there, it's us, it's people being motivated to use it and see what it can deliver. And I think that's where there's a bit of a disconnect. But I, I, let, let me push back a little bit. I, I know this is going to sound very strange probably to this audience, but we look at the trajectory of how much land, how much natural habitat is left on the planet. And we look at business as usual case of how much farmland is encroaching, farmland and ranch land. It's 0.6 of 1% a year over the last 10 years. If that continues, there will be 4% of land that's available in natural form that isn't in national parks by 2050. So if we want that to stop, we don't think consumers ought to have a choice about sustainability. We think every product on the shelf ought to be sustainable. So the question is, how do you make it happen? And we think if you take this logic further, sustainability is a pre-competitive issue. Really? So that means that companies need to start working on it. Well, let's just take one example of this. Right now, there is a, a disease that's attacking orange groves all around the world. And within 10 to 15 years, we will not have orange juice unless all those plantations are moved to a totally new area, and then we'll wait for another 10 to 20 years before those areas get infected. So if you are the two companies that control 80% of the orange juice market, and you're the four producers, you might have a reason to work together, to collude, if you will, about how to make orange juice sustainable, how to solve greening. That's the way we need to approach these well, issues. What if I said... Wait, wait, I'm not done. So we live on a finite planet. So the companies that we're finding that saw the peak of commodity prices in 2008 are now scrambling because they know to have raw materials in the future, they've got to develop a whole new supply chain strategy. They've got to work with producers. They've got to develop partnerships. They've got to use one, three, five, 17 year contracts to lock in supply. But they've also got to address sustainability issues together no company's big enough to do this by themselves. But and government is too late. Look at Copenhagen. How much, how many signals do we need that government is not going to manage the planet? How is this going to happen? Because I happen to think that many people in this audience right. and in the world would say, you know, we ought to have preventive health care, and that should be really f a focus right. of the American health care system. And we shouldn't be paying $75,000 per person to keep people alive for the last month of life and nothing in the previous 70 years. Yet we're often doing that. Our system is completely backward and most people agree that it's completely backward. And we can't, you know, we can't produce things, you can't make things in this country because co companies can't afford the health care. But, but These are rational arguments that don't seem amenable to rational solutions. But, but I want to go back to the greening discussion. I wrote the genetics piece in the greening paper for the National Research Council of the National Academy of Science, and the two big juice companies did not show up. 
But they're there now. Oh, the, well, I know. They read the report. And, <laughs> and, and their future. But just truth and effort, this is Pepsi and Coke. It's Minute Maid and Dropicana, just in case. But when we were doing this and we requested their assistance, it was the thing that, that put me over the edge, that they wouldn't show up and engage in the dialogue. Now, if you were, I think it's about a $9 billion juice business out of Florida alone for these two companies, you'd think they would be interested in the conversation, and they weren't. So this is what drove me in, uh, with a conversation with Jason. Beyond the food wedges, I mean, who do you have to have at the table? So right. the reason I was late yesterday was because I was at a meeting with the president of NEPAD, uh, the vice president of uh, UNEP. You should probably say what uh, those things NEPAD are. NEPAD is the new African Partnership for Agriculture Development, which is mandating 10% of budgets go to research. Of course, it's never happened, but it will. And the new uh, CEO is really quite an interesting man who's willing to put his life on the line for this. But then we had UNEP there, we had the African Development Bank there, we had the public scientific sector there, and then we had the private scientific sector. And we agreed at that meeting that in 12 months we have to have the roadmap. We don't have any more time. So while I was discouraged by what happened with the National Research Council report, I believe that we, uh, this is why I said 12 months. I'd like to come back here in 12 months and tell you what we've agreed to and how we're gonna tackle these problems. I mean, malnutrition is not gonna go away because we talk about it. Malnutrition is gonna go away because we take on my wish list or dream right. list and all well, the things and, that you've and, talked and about. Yeah, that's what, but I'm agreeing to that. So Yeah, exactly. And I think that what we've got here are, we're being strategic. Exactly. There's no, no entity is gonna focus on all nine of these things that I identified, but everyone has something they can work on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in if you take global food, 100 companies touch 25% of the trade of the most significant commodities globally. So it's not like we have to work with 6.7 billion consumers. We don't have to. Everything on the shelf should be sustainable. How do you get there? Well, we're right now doing an assessment of all the palm oil supplies for Cargill. Why is that important? Cargill buys 25% of the world's palm oil. So if their suppliers are sustainable, then all the palm oil Cargill sells to China is sustainable too. And we don't have to work with a single Chinese company to make that happen. I, I, so that it's because of this that I'm optimistic. Because you know, if, if you define, if you build lists and you define targets, there's at least a 50-50 chance you're going to hit them. We don't have a clue what you're chasing. Then the outcomes right. are usually guaranteed. And the thing that's happened in the last, I was going to say two years, but it's less than it, that. It's really two. Is yeah. there's a crystallization and there's a coalescence around some of these issues. And there's disparate parties arriving at tables around the world. The World Economic Forum has brought together the su supply chain in agriculture, which is very fragmented, and have started defining some of these targets. There's a road show that's it'll be in Tanzania and Vietnam before January again, working through these lists. There's one additional wedge that I'd, that I'd like to throw into the mix, and it applies here in the US, it applies in the emerging economies, and that is youth and education. Because in emerging economies, the hardest sales pitch in the world is there's a great future for you in agriculture because everybody's <laughs> running away from the farm. They don't, you know, being out in the baking sun planting seeds is not the definition of a good day. They, they, they want to work in factories, they want to be in towns, they want. So, youth education, curriculum development, yeah. enhancement of science. So, the 13 year olds in America today, if you look at Howard's list, they're the future biologists, bioinformaticians, genomicists in 10 years' time. And any one of Howard's wish list products takes eight to 10 years to build. And there's very few shortcuts. It's getting cheaper, but it isn't getting faster. So the 13 year olds today are the 23 year olds who he's gonna be celebrating in a decade's time who crack the code in these things. My concern, my next concern is we're organized, we're better focused, groups are coming together. There's 13 year olds out there who are gonna be the next Nobel Prize winners. We're doing a really average job in the US of producing them. And in many other parts of the world, the last thing they're looking at right now is agriculture. So as a take home project, for those of you with kids, or those of you who know kids, or those of you involved in education, agriculture's cool. And 
The look at us, right? Look at us, yeah. <laughs> you can grow beards and everything. Or not. <laughs> so I, I, th I, I think um, there's a 10-year lag, and I'm really intrigued on in how you bring talent back into the space. Well, isn't one of the, I mean, this is a bit far afield, but isn't one of the fundamental problems here education <laughs> itself? Because what you see in society, when you see reactions to science that are irrational, people don't understand. They don't understand statistics or probability or possibility. So all these things are not pie in the sky. They can really happen. But to get them implemented requires not just focus on the top, but focus on the bottom. And that's where I think we run into some But, it, but let's, let's just, I think it requires focus, period, full stop. If we can focus on four or six things, we can make them happen. Yep. If we're throwing spaghetti against the wall a year from now, we're not going to make okay, anything Okay, what happen. are the four things we should be focusing on right now? If you're looking at sustainable ag from an environmental point of view, it's about soil, soil, soil. About water, water, about habitat, about toxicity. I mean, you don't really need to go further than that. I mean, that's what it's about. Everything and comes from that. And what if, oh, go ahead. There's, and there's a key piece here, because uh, having worked on the organic standards, the national standards, as one of the authors of that, and having worked on a really massive uh, change agent, which is that Mars will only buy certified sustainable cocoa by 2020, the thing that we saw the race to the bottom about was that people would be happy to certify 400 kilos per hectare. 400 kilos per hectare is abject poverty. So we determined that we would not certify poverty. But you have to bring people along. You can't just abandon them. So let's say it's seven years and it was Jason said, good agronomy gives you another 135 uh, kilos. Uh, some fertilizer gives you about 385 kilos more. Some good water. Water, water, water use efficiency gives you, plus genetics, better planting material, 500 kilos. You're now up to 1,500 kilos, with almost having done nothing. So we've decided that's the bottom line. Yeah. So in seven to 10 years, the word certification has to mean economic, social, cultural, environment, ecological. And productivity. and productivity. Can I just ask about Africa for a minute? Because these things aren't just scientific, and you mentioned that. They're political. They're trade issues. Europe objects to genetically engineered foods for lots of reasons. I think those objections are going down a bit, but they're still difficult. And those things get reflected in how African governments act, whether they import food, whether they grow food, how they approach agriculture. And that is something. I think it's still a really big problem. I mean, we don't have vitamin A rice in the ground for reasons like this. We don't have things we know how to do that would help millions of people in the ground. So last year, the imports, or 2008, last year we have data for, was 40 billion US dollars. I don't mean Cote d'Ivoire francs. I don't mean CDs you mean from any place else. I mean US dollars. So let's work on figuring out how to take 10% of that and put it back into agriculture. So 10% of the imports, and in five to 10 years, that number would be down to 10 billion imports. So we would have taken their entire exportation of dollars and put it back into the infrastructure. Now, can you actually convince them to put $4 billion? And I think the time is now. I think Who I, does the convincing? NEPAD, the agency of the AU and the donor community. And the companies that are buying the, you know. Everyone. What's it worth, you know, 2008 showed, to that period 2006 to 2008 with the high price spikes in commodities really scared the hell out of companies. Because how much money do you make if you can't buy sugar to make your product? You know, it doesn't matter what the price is. If it's not available, you're, you're screwed. And so that's what companies are really working on. That's why they're trying to help ensure that they have crops to buy. Why did Mars invest $10 million to do the genome of cocoa? They don't want to be an IP company. They don't want to own the genomics. They want co chocolate in the future. Yep. But when so you, when you invest in something, brinjal is what Indians call eggplant. There's GE brinjal. Mm -hmm. To the best of my understanding of reading the data, it's a good product. Mm -hmm. It's gone through seven regulatory right. reviews in India. And those reviews weren't crap. They were right. serious US level reviews, passed every one. I don't think there was any controversy about the safety issues. No one's ever been shown to be made sick by eating those things. And it's a very important crop. It was, it's now been kicked out 
because the environmental minister said, hey, we, we need to study this more. Right. But I think, but it, when but do we stop needing to study more? But I think it's cracking. I think the I system think. is cracking. Look at China. Last November, they, they, they pretty much did a blanket acceptance of of, of gen genetic engineering. Now, it's got its own issues, et cetera, but I think we're going to see country by country beginning to look at this. And why is China important? Because if you look, who's investing in Africa right now? It's not Europe. It's not the U.S. The first quarter of this year, China invested $5 billion in, in Africa. India, Brazil, and Russia invested $8 billion more in Africa. You know, what we don't realize is the global economy is still growing. We're not. That's right. And the South-South trade is phenomenal. In 2009, Brazil exported 30% more soybeans to China than it did in 2008. In 2010, already Brazil is up 10% more to China. The South-South trade is moving because this is where the people are. This is where consumption increases are taking place. And are the Chinese in Africa explaining why these things work and why they're helpful? No, they haven't started yet because no, they've only got the policy adopted in November. But what I'm saying is they're cracking. This I is starting to change. I and India will too. It's early days, but it's, you know, in the wrap up of Aspen, I think there's cause for optimism. And if you remember my ski slope, the 150, the 50, the 29, and, and you say there's no new things, so how do you democratize what you have? Um, the one that drives me nuts is I think brinjal, you know, brinjal is eggplant, it's aubergine. They spray aubergines in India 40 times. So in a harvest interval, you know, 60 days to grow an aubergine, they're spraying every other day because th there's these bugs with big, long, pointy noses. And if they make a hole in that aubergine, it rots. So they, they're spraying every day. So it'll come. It's, it's, so I... I, I'm now losing sleep in aubergine. I'm, I'm, <laughs> my passion in this is, here's the how come. How come hybrid corn that's been around since 1940? 20. 20s and 30s, yeah. Well, yeah. Henry Wallace. Henry yeah. Wallace, God bless him. So um, Second World War is when it really, mm -hmm. so America and France, get this, and France in 1940, started planting hybrid corn. And the reason that they started planting was yields were bigger. But it's a one-time pop. So the birds and the bees, a sexual cross, you plant it once, you get a yield pop. It's called hybrid vigor. If you keep that seed and you plant it the second year, you get a concomitant loss. So 1940, game on, and the world started planting hybrids. Sometimes in rooms like this, the conversation is, yeah, I know the game of hybrids, you know, you're making economic slaves of the world because they buy that seed and they're forever captured in your power and get over it. It's been 80 years, 60, 70 years, sorry. <laughs> so the challenge for me isn't, you know, is, is, is BT aubergines going to make the grade? It's the conversation in some rooms that says, no, no, you need to leave Africa where they are. It's kind of like that zoo kind of thing. You look through the looking glass. They're happy the way they are. And if we could get quality seed, if we could start introducing hybrids, if we could teach people to manage soil, you can shift the bottom end of this very, very quickly. And that gets all the way back to well, defining some of these priorities and then getting people engaged on simple stuff. And shifting the bottom also provides opportunities. I mean, every developed country in the world use agriculture as a stepping stone. Yeah. The problem is you can't use 25 bushel production in Africa as a stepping stone for anywhere except poverty. It's a banana skin. And so the question is, how can we create more productivity to create local jobs in servicing that? Local yeah. jobs in value-added processing, local ag jobs in turning you know, that into animal protein or into other things that have other values. You know, those are the things that we need to be focusing on but in it, terms of poverty. But, it, but it's a bigger, so Janice is here, my wife. We were in Malawi a few years ago. We drive into a village, big tree in the middle of the village square, and all the kids are underneath the tree. And it's uh, midday, and they're teaching school. But there's a brand new schoolhouse in the village, best looking building in the village, two room schoolhouse. I naively ask, how come the kids aren't in class? Is it because of the heat or is it? No, no, they're, they're, we have the kids outside. Um, it is a new schoolhouse, but the two classrooms are, f are full of corn. 
because they had the huge harvest and they'd nowhere to put it. And if you leave it outside, it gets eaten by the rats and the bugs and the mice. And the so they'd filled the classrooms with corn. And it's that boom and bust thing. And they'd started planting hybrids. It was half hybrids, half uh, indigenous seeds. Um, but there's nowhere to store the surplus. So the other piece of this, how do you build corn cribs? How do you build futures markets? How do you encourage companies right. to take that surplus out? How do you establish market prices? It's imminently doable. But it's, it's, not, it, it, it's, it's the infrastructure that goes, so you get the kids back in the classroom, you get the corn traded in a futures exchange and you start that flywheel. So um, there's none of this complex, but it takes a lot of people sitting down and saying, what part do we all play in this? Mm -hmm. I think I'm required by law to let people ask questions. Um, Good thing. We can let if, there are, if there are questions, uh, we're happy to entertain them. Or try to. We can let every person in here ask a question. Go ahead. Sure. You're supposed to say who you are. That's Hi, it. my name is Martin Davis. Just a question about genetically modified uh, seeds, crops. I'm married to a French woman, so this is always a debate. And you guys made sort of a little bit of a reference to it. But can you debunk the myth now? You, someone said, well, the Europeans have good reason for it. Is there good reason for banning? Whoever, who said Europeans have good reason for it? I think one of the, somebody on the panel had I sort of it said. it was you. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, if I said that, that, then I'd like to bite well, my tongue. Is, is it a myth, or is there some truth to the fact that there's some evidence that eating foods from genetically modified I'll seeds. I'll tell you my view, because it has to do with Monsanto. The person who was the chairman of Monsanto at that time, Bob Shapiro, is someone I think is an agricultural visionary, and I'm a big fan of his. I think when he went into Europe, he thought that because his vision was right and because the science was there, that was enough. And he was a little heavy-handed. I mean, that's an understatement. And I think it caused people to freak out in Europe and basically say, you're not going to tell me what I'm growing and how to eat. Now, that's one fundamental reason. The other reason is there are, environment, there are economic reasons. This is a trade thing. This is about them trading with Africa and them keeping American crops out of Europe and Africa. So in terms of the science, there are no reasons that I see. Maybe you guys do. I think it's changed. I mean, it's 1996 the first crops were launched. Um, we're in 2011, to, you know, to all extents. Um, so for 15, 16, 15 years, two and a half billion acres have been planted around the world. And, you know, I, I think in Europe at that time, um, it was the zenith of mad cow disease. And it was big, it was American, it was corporate, and it was food. And that's not a really great cocktail. Um, and in the middle of mad cow, th th that was exacerbated. Mad cow disease in Europe, Europe is cold and wet. It rains a lot. They struggle to grow enough plant protein to feed their animals. So what they'd started doing was chopping up animals and feeding them animals. So it was brains and spinal column and waste material. And that's where protein was sourced from. Kind of horrible. And that didn't go too well for them. <laughs> so they went back to the idea of feeding plants to animals. And the biggest plant-based source of the biggest protein, plant-based protein source is soybeans. So in that 15 years, to, to Jason's point, the trade flow of soybeans has increased. And Brazil, Argentina, and the US sell a whole bunch of soy protein into Europe, which, which is all produced with biotech. So there's this weird, weird, delicious hot hypocrisy on, oh no, we, we don't plant that stuff. And 85% right. of all the soy consumed in Europe is GM. So it's, it, it just, I think we'll look back in, in years to come with a wry smile, but we're kind of living through it at the moment. I think it's got better. I, I would add one other point. If you look at the total agricultural production in Europe, it's, they're not feeding themselves in Northern Europe. They're going much farther south. Portugal, Spain, Turkey, yeah. and agriculture in Europe is largely subsidies. Mm -hmm. And a person can do much better on the subsidies than they can on the milk farming. they're selling by farming. And if you have a paradigm that is uniquely set up for stasis as opposed to improvement, 
nothing's going to change. And you know, we, could, we can debate even more. I think I read somewhere recently, there's a billion human eating years of genetically engineered food. A billion, you know, 250, America, 250 million Americans times four years gives you that. But however you make up the number, and we don't see any problems. Now, it's the precautionary principle. I hear this all the time from my European colleagues. It's not to say they're wrong, it's not to say they're right. But most of the rest of the world doesn't really care. Because China's going to do it, India will do it. They are doing it. Yes. But, if, if you're but gonna, I think if they, you're are gonna, wrong. they are wrong. No, because because well, I can't, you do I can't. have a lot of data. And no one's ever gotten sick yeah, eating this. No, but, but, but even from the precautionary principle, frankly, is being invoked around the environment, not about human health. True. Um, and, and the thing that I think, if you're going to invoke the precautionary principle, apply it both ways. What happens if you adopt the technology? What Correct. happens if you don't? Correct. When Europe refused to import GM soy, fine, that's their choice. That led to deforestation in Brazil to plant soy. What's the worst evil here? We got to get real about this. We got to focus on the results yeah. and let, you know, and, and, and then look at the practices that get us there. I mean, that's to your point about innovation. Subsidies encourage a continuation of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Results, if you say this is the result we want, then a thousand producers will find a thousand different ways to get there. Mm -hmm. And one of them is going to be so much further that it's going to really be innovative. If you say you have to adopt organic, you have to adopt IPM, you have to adopt one specific system, then that's what you're going to get. You're going to get compliance. You're not going to get innovation. So we, got to, we have to let other people Michael, scream at you. Yeah. Not this Shapiro, another one. <laughs> In, I'm Bob Hoffman. At the time that you're talking about, I was the vice chairman of Monsanto. My office was next to Shapiro's. And what you said is absolutely right. He, he went to Europe, and, and we thought that uh, science would win out. The other thing that was in there, though, uh, which a lot of people don't understand, is that Greenpeace at that time was going broke because they had championed cleaning up the environment. There had been a lot of laws passed, the EPA of the United States and in Europe. And, and they, in fact, their raison d'etre was going out of business, and they needed a cause. And True. so they decided that GM uh, seeds was, was a good cause. And they, they coined that Frankenstein food uh, Frank uh, saying. Food. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and we had a memo, which I saw, and I wish I'd kept it, uh, from, from a lady, a German lady who was the head of that effort within Greenpeace, which said we really ought to be in favor of these things because, you know, you use GM, you put less... Uh, uh, toxic chemicals into the water. You, there's all kinds of environmental reasons why they're good, but we need we need to raise money. We think we can do it. No, what happened was they that Shapiro and and the rest of us at Monsanto and the people at Dupont with Pioneer, uh, we all underestimated uh, the ability, and they really turned public opinion in Europe against GM with no scientific basis for it whatsoever. Uh, wait, wait, wait. We, there's lots of people with questions, and I agree, but I think this is history that we probably shouldn't, you know. Yeah, but I think it's a that. reason why he asked about why, why Europe is, is against I know, GM. It's a re but there's so many questions, I think we should let a variety of types be asked. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Juan Mario Lacerna. I am uh, uh, from Colombia. I'm a newly elected senator from a region that uses a lot of Monsanto crops. Uh, two years ago, uh, thousands of peasants were ruined by the Monsanto crops because it actually didn't work out that well. So you have, I think, I don't know how many lawsuits now. So when that fails in a really rural community, in a poor community, I myself planted cotton with that. What is your corporate responsibility? How do you deal with communities? I mean, all this is very nice, but you have to <laughs> bring it to the to the. Okay, so there's a the question. Let him answer it. Yeah. So I hadn't heard the Colombian story. I think um, when crops fail, the people who sell the seed are responsible. Um, my example in hybrids. So anywhere in the world, when farmers grow crops, their whole focus is on risk mitigation. So farmers aren't focused on winning big. Farmers are really focused on don't lose. And if you're a one acre farmer and you lose, you go hungry. When you're a thousand acre farmer and you lose, the bank takes your farm. So far, my, my experience with farmers around the world, 
their whole focus is um, don't lose a crop. Um, hybrids in, in vegetables or in corn, or the reason that they're popular is they mitigate risk. They have a more dependable outcome. Uh, but not always, that's true. Well, I'm, I'm not aware of your huge failures. There's a gentleman who's been waiting here for oh, okay. 30 okay. years. We'll get to you, Andy. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Raymond Learzy. So I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, yes. You, at the very beginning, you talked about the major inputs of water and fertilizers. And this conversation is really veered toward seed and water. Very little has been discussed about fertilizers. And... Um, you know, uh, in the oil world, everybody talks about peak oil right. mm -hmm. and uh, the danger peak of plastic. running out of oil. Mm. In, in the agricultural world, you have two elements that are key to the production of crops, phosphates and potash. And I'd like to ask whether there is really a danger because these are mined and you have a country like India this year alone will be importing close to 5 million tons of potash. And I'm just curious whether there is a danger of not being able to access sufficient quantities of each of these minerals in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I've heard the figure bantied around of peak, peak potassium, 90 years, peak phosphate, 120. Uh, oil is, is in some ways further off in terms of how, it's, how scarce it is. What's particularly distressing about those two nutrients is that they are essential for tree crops and perennials. And we think, at least from an environmental perspective, that the more calories and nutrition we can produce on perennials, the less environmental impact there is. And so that's a huge bottleneck if we can't figure out how to, to get more of those two nutrients. We've even started a project in Florida now in the Everglades to actually reduce phosphorus in the, in the Everglades because it, it, it's one of the nutrients that leads to cattails and invasives and other things. And so we're sequestering it with ranchers and, and the state of Florida and the U.S. government are paying them to reduce it. But now we have to figure out how to harvest what has been taken out of the water and reapply it to land in other places where it's needed. And we haven't got that technology yet. I'd love to see an X prize for $10 million to figure out how to take phosphate and how to take potassium and, and, and re and, and, and bring them together so that they would be in concentrations we could use. And I would go back to my point of efficiency. We're not really right. breeding for these nutrient use efficiencies. Yes. So do I think we could reduce the need 70%? I think that's probably doable in the 10 to 15 year horizon for potassium and, and uh, particularly potassium in trees, but certainly uh, phosphorus as well. But that has not been a driver. So if I can make 90 years, 270 years by tripling the uh, uh, amount that I have to use each year and doing the simple math, that's a big success. And that'll give me time to even figure out the next thing. But all of these pieces have to be taken outside of the context of whether you think a pro company like Monsanto, DuPont, Sakata, Takai, whoever you want to talk about is going to solve that. Or is this where the public sector has to go after it through the ag universities, through the big research at Max Planck at these places, and make that trait available to everyone to use without restriction. So that's my answer to it. We have to go after it. The public sector has to go after it. The University of California, Davis, or whoever it is, has to go after those things to figure that out, because it is a real problem. We've, yeah. we've shown in, in some research that we did that, one, that you can rehabilitate degraded land and plant tree crops on it and have a much higher productivity than clearing forest with palm oil, for example. But the one variable that you can't get away from right now is 175 kilos of rock phosphate per hectare. Yeah. We, you've we've got to have that. We've worked. Um, we think it's possible to double the yields in corn, soy, and cotton by about 2030. Um, and use a third less water and fertilizer. 
and we've, we've worked backwards. We had 400 scientists uh, work on this two years ago and start building the milestones as you walk backwards saying, what are the rate limiting steps? And once you get past husbandry, soil management, better water utilization, you hit a wall with fertilizer. And a great deal of fertilizer that's applied is wasted. It, it ends up in um, streams, aquifers, and, and tap water. S so it will become um, a rate limiting step. And figuring that um, utilization and uptake is, is a, it's a real, <coughs> it's a research target that we're working on. Andy? Yeah, sure. Uh, Andy Revkin, New York Times and Pace University. Uh, Jason, I love the, uh, the idea of agricultural wedges like we have in the energy climate realm. To, but they, are, they just delineate the, the, the you know, in, cli in climate it's nuclear efficiency, blah, blah, blah. So what I would love to know is within the wedge, uh, the behavioral wedge, the best practices wedge, where you have that huge gap, a huge opportunity to spread best practices in places where there's, there's none. What are, the, what are the protocols or opportunities for doing extension service or ac what are the American academic institutions not doing in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that they can be doing? What would it look like to build out that, that wedge, which to me is, the innovation's gonna happen, it could happen a lot faster. Same thing with photovoltaics. Right. Uh, but what's gonna happen on the ground in places where you have all this vulnerability now and opportunity now? So I, th I think, you know, that one of the things that, that I mentioned is that, is that extension services have really cut back and those extension services were connected to universities. In the US, they've cut back more than they have in, in many developing countries, in fact. Uh, they're pretty much dead uh, on arrival now in the US, with a few exceptions in some states. But what that means is that I think as, as companies begin to buy and contract in over one, three, five, 17 years, they're getting more and more engaged in how those pro crops are produced. And it's not always about best practices, but it's often about impacts. And because impacts are what the retailers and brands and manufacturers pose the biggest risk to them. But those impacts can be reduced through better practices. And so these two are part of the same system. Coke just signed a 17 year contract with growers in Turkey for fruit juice. They did it because the growers were moving from an annual crop to a perennial and they wanted to have a guaranteed market for it for the life of the tree. But now Coke has got to come up with a whole system for giving them extension, helping them understand it, et cetera, helping them do some of the value added processing locally. Because they have a 17 year contract though, these growers can go to a bank and borrow money at lower rates. They can go to input suppliers and get better genetics, get better inputs, get lower cost on these because they're gonna be buying it over 17 years. Coke is also even buying the carbon that's sequestered in the tree to offset the shipment of this fruit to the European market. So this is how supply chains are evolving. And I think part of the role here really is the private sector. But each company probably can't do this by themselves. So we're gonna have to figure out ways to begin to collude on this stuff, to begin to work together to at least, uh, to, to, to begin to see how there might be a new world out there. Andy, I'd, I'd just say, there's been a depletion on USAID in some of these projects, and you're beginning to see that being resurrected, which is a good thing. Um, you have thousands of NGOs that are subscale, but very well intentioned, who compete directly with each other for sources of funding and don't share data. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen in the last two or three years is you see scale size philanthropy with targets and milestones are funding at, at harder appropriate levels and sharing data mm -hmm. and reporting mm -hmm. results. It doesn't guarantee success, but, it, but it's a step it's in the better. right direction. That's the second thing. And the third, the, the, the third piece of this is much more engagement w with um, local NGOs and governments. And mm -hmm. you know the, the situation where you, you fly in and, and you're picking your luggage o off the carousel and there's two NGOs next to you also picking off the luggage off the same carousel, you know, same bed and dreaming different dreams. <laughs> I, th I, think that's, I think that's changing. So, you know, this whole hour on defining targets, defining lists, resourcing appropriately, and then sharing data, I, I think that's an interesting, that collaborative model, I think, is emerging. 
I can just add I think one we, quick point to that. Okay, and then we have time for, I think, one more question. Extension in Africa has largely uh, disappeared completely. Yeah. Uh, it's been replaced by uh, entrepreneurs who are doing it. I would not say they're well trained. It hasn't d disappeared in every country, but most. The, the advent of microcredit being available to people actually allows them to hire expertise to come in and help them. Hmm. Now the NGOs basically fly underneath the radar. Not everyone, but many of them. And until the governments, the parastatals, and the NGOs, and the private sector, and the public sector all operate collaboratively, pre-competitively, so us with all of our competitors, Monsanto with all their competitors, WWF with all their competitors, until you actually go in there and really be pre-competitive, it, it's just not going to change because these NGOs, lifeblood, are these grants. The other thing is, huh? I define... I, de I define, really out of time. Uh, I, I cannot find baselines that come out of most of these places for the work that's been done. So it's very hard to even measure success. Yeah. Okay, one, one last question. If, if there's a mic over there. Hi, I'm Amy Well, and it's a really quick question. Have you thought about how educating and empowering women will help? Well, women are a key part of all of the trainings. Women are the recipients of most of the microcredit as, you, as we start to see the models being developed by Rabobank based on Grameen. The women are doing most of the work. They're collecting most of the tree crops. Uh, Alan Blackia Floribunda is known as the school fee tree because the nuts are available to be crushed into oil at school fee time. So women are being, in every project that is meaningful today, that is going to move forward successfully, women are an integral part of the training. But it's more than training. It's also about property rights. That's a key yeah. issue for women. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and I particularly want to thank the panel for their amazing insights and time.